Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to another edition of the Tax Policy Center's Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Mark Mazur. I'm the Robert C. Posen Director of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. And our guest today is United States Senator Ron Wyden. We're honored that he's here uh, with us today to talk about tax reform and other fiscal policy issues in what I hope is a wide-ranging conversation. So let me cover some basic housekeeping issues. First, during the program today, I encourage the audience to use the hashtag live at urban when commenting on social media about today's event. That's hashtag live at urban. Second, for those watching um, via webcast today, if you want to comment on the proceedings or ask a question during the Q&A session, please send those questions via email to events at urban.org. There'll be someone there monitoring the account and those questions will get folded into the discussion. Third, for the people in the audience here, um, when we get to the question and answer period, there are cards on your um, chair to um, write down questions for Senator Wyden during the, the Q&A portion of today's event. Um, staff people will be circulating in the room to pick up those and we'll be able to get those into the, into the conversation. And finally, um, Tax Policy Center is part of the community of tax scholars and I know Many of you saw that we retracted some analysis um, of the Ways and Means tax proposal yesterday when we found some errors. Um, we're in the process of addressing these concerns and we should have a revised analysis out in the near future. Um, all of us at TPC, we, we really do appreciate your support um, and we're gonna get this right because we all believe that facts and objective analysis matters. Um, now let me turn to the formal part of the, the program today and introduce our, our distinguished guest, Senator, Senator Ron Wyden. Senator Wyden's no stranger to the Tax Policy Center. In fact, he was here last March to talk about uh, corporate tax reform, so it's really a pleasure to, to have him back again. Uh, Senator Wyden is the senior senator from Oregon, having served over two decades in the United States Senate after a distinguished House career. Senator Wyden's currently the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee, where he, the committee oversees federal tax policy, trade policy, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, many other programs. Um, Senator Wyden is well known for his work ethic and his commitment to developing bipartisan solutions to our nation's problems, including uh, broad-based tax reform. Um, Senator Wyden is one of the, the few who's put together a bipartisan tax plan, um, both with Senator Gregg and with Senator Coates, um, perhaps the only bipartisan plan that's been out there in decades. Um, so. Join me to uh, welcome Senator Wyden to the stage. Um, we're to the podium. Thank you. Mark, thanks very much. And uh, you can always get an inflationary introduction when you come here. And let's make this a filibuster-free zone this morning. And I'll take just a few minutes to give you uh, assessment of some of the major takeaways with respect to the Republican plan. The first uh, comment I want to make this morning involves something I read in a newspaper report last couple days on the tax bill. And it said that a conservative group had hired some messaging gurus to test out various tax lines on voters. And apparently the most effective line was, quote, the plan will benefit those who need it most, the middle class. The far right sure wasted a lot of money on that pollster. As one independent analysis after another shows, it's clear that Republicans have put forward a tax plan that is overwhelmingly skewed towards big corporations and those who are at what I call the top of the top. Last week, the Joint Committee on Taxation said that nearly eight out of ten dollars in the Republican tax cuts go to corporations or the wealthiest estates in America. Put your arms around that. And I mean, again, this is the Joint Committee on Taxation. These are the people who are vested with the responsibility to just kind of stick to the facts, make a hard judgment, they said eight out of ten dollars in the plan goes to the folks at the top. So much for the old Mnuchin rule, no absolute tax cut for the wealthy. Now I am coming off 
just haven't had four open to all town hall meetings in Oregon over the weekend. And I can tell you, based on the conversations that I had over the weekend, middle class Americans aren't buying the idea that this plan is all about them. They understand it for what it is, a middle class con job. There was one tax issue in particular that stuck out, and it dealt with the unfairness of eliminating the student loan interest deduction. Of course, college grads under this bill will no longer be able to write off their student loan interest payments. But when I said multinational corporations that ship jobs overseas are going to be able to keep a nice chunk of their interest payment right off. Everybody just like was unbelievable, just really became furious. This is just one of the gross double standards in the proposal, and I think you're going to see more and more of these examples hitting the front pages of newspapers and driving lots of traffic online. Another example. I'd wager that a lot of families of modest means are going to be shocked and concerned when they hear about how the Republican plan could hike prices on everyday consumer products. This is all about the base erosion excise tax, which in my view is just Washington lingo for a new grocery tax, a new auto tax, a new clothing tax. It'll mean that a grocery shopper in Medford, Oregon could be out an extra 50 bucks with every trip to our iconic grocery store, Fred Meyer. People in the market for new cars are going to have to reconsider what they fit within their budget because the Republican tax bill sent the sticker price a few thousand dollars higher. A single mom taking her kids back to school shopping might have to scale back her expectations of what's affordable for her. These kinds of revelations, I believe, are going to continue to make news in the next few days. And the end result of the bill is going to be a tax hike on millions of American families. There's also the talking point that I'm sure you've uh, heard over the last few weeks that this bill is a big win for simplicity. And they're all holding up those cards and everything's going to be so simple and all that. There's no way you can look at the new pass-through loophole and come away that this Republican plan makes the tax code a whole lot easier to deal with. Suddenly, there's going to be a new 70-30 rule having to do with categorizing income. Now, if that's not murky enough, there's a, quote, facts and circumstances test that will make things even more uh, cloudy in terms of working your way through the complexity of this loophole. So I hope everybody recognizes one thing. Every time the phrase facts and circumstances is uttered on Capitol Hill, Another tax lobbyist on K Street makes partner. <laughs> it is going to be one big bonanza for the accountants and the tax lawyers. And my view is there's no way the Internal Revenue Service can administer that kind of extraordinarily complicated system. So, so much for simplicity. The bottom line is the centerpiece of the Republican tax bill's big corporate cut, and it is not temporary like the family tax cuts are. And this was something that we focused on in Oregon that people have picked up, is for the folks at the top, their breaks are written in ink, set in stone, locked in place. But if you're middle class, I guess everything's going to be written in disappearing ink because that stuff is temporary. Now, Republicans are going to say this is all about helping corporations invest and hire. But 
here's the reality. The big corporations are already awash in capital. This is about, in fact, this is among the defining characteristics of the American economy after the Great Recession. Profits are up, unemployment is down, times are good. There is no shortage of cash. The big economic challenge of the last several years has been figuring out how to make sure that workers get to share in this prosperity, that wages of workers go up. There's no reason whatsoever to believe that this Republican tax ha handout to the corporations is really going to significantly help increasing the prosperity of the economic engine in America where the middle class drives 70 percent of the economic activity. Furthermore, corporate heads are already out there previewing their plans to use the big tax handouts to fund stock buybacks, retire debt, pass on windfalls to shareholders. Not exactly the kind of talk there among uh, the folks doing the uh, previews of the plans that sounds like a big win for the middle class. So as you look at this bill from various angles and you're left scratching your head, you have to wonder what economic problem the Republicans are actually trying to solve with the bill. They're really just crumbs for the middle class. And my view is that the crumbs for the middle class are pretty much designed to try to distract the middle class from seeing that most of the breaks go to the people at the top. And we're all seeing these articles about so many middle class folks seeing their taxes go up as the temporary tax cuts phase out. College grads being out billions of dollars as paying off loans becomes more expensive. Vulnerable people with big out-of-pocket medical expenses, particularly seniors, taking an enormous hit. And I mean, just picture this. We've tried to unpack this. I was director of the Oregon Gray Panthers um, for almost seven years um, before I came to Congress. I had a full head of hair and rugged good looks and all that. <laughs> but if you're like 61 years old and you've got, you know, cancer, you're pre-Medicare, you could really be headed for trouble. If you're on Medicare, you know, for example, the staff has been looking at some of the Part B drugs, the really expensive, you know, drugs. You could really be hurting um, as well. And I'll tell you something. No senior in America in the fall of 2016 was told by the Trump campaign that they were going to lose their uh, medical deduction. They were all told they were going to be fine. They weren't told anything like they're going to see in that big loss of the medical um, deduction. I mentioned the grocery tax, everyday costs higher for families. And I'm going to close by way of just contrasting this with what happened in 1986 and what I did with Dan Coates and with Judd Gregg. In 1986, and Bill Bradley calls up sort of every few days to kind of check in and hear about it. And he's just flabbergasted that this is the process because they had scores of meetings to discuss the specifics. They had hearings. Bill Bradley flew all over the country to meet with Republican officials and Jim Baker and Don Regan. There's none of that going on. Judd Gregg and I sat on a sofa every week for almost two years to put together our bill. And half the time we just wanted to take the books and throw them out the window. You know, it's just hopeless, can't be done. As Mark said, that is the first comprehensive bipartisan federal income tax reform bill since 86. And then Dan Coates, to his credit, now a member of the Trump camp uh, cabinet, I'd point out, picked up and uh, had some good ideas um, as well. So contrast that to what we're seeing now, where Republicans are driving this plan through Congress, um, because the fact is this Republican proposal can't stand sunlight. If this is out there, it's going to burn up. It's going to burn up. 
because middle class people are going to be concerned about what's in it. And when they hear Republicans are trying to pass this thing before anybody gets a chance to reach for the cranberry sauce at Thanksgiving, they're going to see what this thing is really um, all about. What we have here is a bill written behind closed doors, not a word of Democratic input, no legislative hearings on the content of the plan. A few days after the release, uh, the Ways and Means Committee begins its, its markup. And I'm concerned that we could have the same pattern in the Senate. You know, we're trying to get a sense of what they're going to do, but certainly there's a real prospect that they'll start in the Senate, the Finance um, Committee, marking up a bill with major changes um, here in a week or something like that. And not one Democrat on the Finance Committee knows what's in the bill at this point. That's not a way to handle legislation, in my view, when you're talking about reshaping the American um, economy. So that's my sense of where we are. And um, softball questions are especially welcome. <laughs> and let's just talk about what you're interested in. And again, big thanks to Mark and the, uh, the Center for their um, usual uh, professional job of making sure that we have a real debate and have a real discussion. Thank you. That's me. That'll do. So I'm going to start off with uh, a few questions, maybe maybe softball, maybe not softball questions, and then we'll open it up to the to the audience. So so first up. Um, what parts of the tax code are most in need of reform, and what parts work well? Well, I think we all understand that the people you want to target the relief to are the middle class. I mean, what the pollsters for the Republicans showed, what we know from whether it's town meetings or talking to small businesses and, and others, uh, that's where you got to put the focus. And yet that's not what this bill does. I, I really do think that there are really two parts to the political strategy of this bill. One, try to see if some of the middle class can get some crumbs and then they'll get distracted. And then I think there's an effort to try to make some um, tucks and nips and little changes in the things that some of the traditional Republican business supporters want to try to get them you know, on board. So I can tell you, I think there are plenty of provisions I keep. The earned income tax credit comes to mind. And I read yesterday that they're talking about saying, well, there are problems with the earned income tax credit. We need more program integrity. Let's make it harder for employers and, and the like. But I think the, the overall strategy is very clear here. Try to put together a huge tax cut for the Republican donor class. And one of the most, I think, ominous aspects of this is just this is just the opposite of what happened in 1986. In 1986, and you remember this, Mark, and you all have been studying it, you know, the corporations were the ones who really took some hits. The focus was on the middle class. Uh, Ronald Reagan, I guess for Republicans today, would have supported policies that made him a rabid socialist. He said that let's make the rate the same for income and um, for investments. So in 86, the corporations took the hit, and the middle class folks got some benefits. We're doing just the opposite here. So, and why is tax reform so hard? Well, under the best of circumstances, real tax reform means getting people together and making tough choices. I mean, the reality is since 1986, We've had almost one tax change a day since 1986. There have been 
thousands and thousands of changes. So a lot of those have been because lobbyists and others figured out how to get, again, a change here and a, and a change there. But every one of them has a loophole. And those loopholes very often get lobbyists to defend them. So the reason you make tax reform bipartisan is so people can come together mm -hmm. and make um, tough choices. And what I think has been missed in this whole debate is bipartisanship is not just a good government cause. With bipartisanship, you get the certainty and predictability that you need for long-term innovation and growth. Because if you pass a strictly partisan bill, the first thing that happens as soon as it's done is people say, well, as soon as the other side takes over, they're going to go out and make all these changes. So you better keep that in mind if you're thinking about doing something innovative and something that's growth oriented. And so just a point you made earlier, you focused on the middle class to try to figure out what the benefits of, of uh, tax reform should be. How do you answer those who say, well, really, it's all about economic growth. We need to set the stage so that we can have a uh, uh, big inflow of, of investment and uh, higher levels of economic growth in the future? Well, again, I believe you grow the economy around the middle class. I mentioned that the consumer drives 70% of the economic activity. And we've known that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the legendary industrialist Henry Ford, in effect, said, hey, look, I'm the head of this company. I want to be successful. I want to do well. For me to do well, my people have to have enough money to buy my cars. So first, I think it's clear that the evidence suggests that it's the middle class that's driving the economy. But the idea that the corporate income tax cut is going to lead to all of this growth for ordinary workers, you know, people on the shop floor, a truck driver, a cashier, I just don't buy this. And let's just kind of unpack this a little bit more. So you've got the corporations. They're already awash in capital. There's no shortage of cash. So um, if they want to invest in job creation and wages and the like, they can go do that. And of course, they're claiming that um, their money is trapped overseas. I mean, the reality is a lot of them have stashed their profits in tax havens to avoid US taxes. And we have evidence that this trickle-down economic theory that they have been using here to justify, if you just give the break to the big corporations, it's all going to trickle down to the, to the working, working class. Um, there was an original paper up at the uh, Trump administration you know, website that would support, um, that would show that this theory of trickle down was um, false, that the findings have been universally panned, and then they basically took it down. So I think they know that this is not a winning strategy. So let me switch gears a little bit and, and just get, uh, ask you a little personal question. So I know as a, as a younger man, you played college basketball. Were there any lessons you got I was from your dreaming yeah. of playing in the NBA. It was a ridiculous idea. I got a college scholarship, got an offer actually from Gonzaga, which we kept around just to prove that a Jewish guy could get an <laughs> offer from Gonzaga. But I wasn't going to play in the NBA because I was too small and I made up for it by being really slow. <laughs> and I mean, I think. The, the lessons, I think, Mark, if I were to state it, is a basketball team does well when everybody is in it together and everybody is having an opportunity to get ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got people contributing and assisting and the like. That's the problem with this tax bill and what's missing from what's being done now to what was done in 86 and what Judd Gregg and I and Dan Coates tried to do. We were trying to give everybody the opportunity to get ahead. And I think if you think back about sports or you're asking me about personal, that's the lesson I learned. 
So just one other question before we go to the, to the audience. Um, last week we hosted Commissioner Koskinen here, um, and it's his uh, last week of uh, being IRS Commissioner. Um, what do you think of the job that he did as, as Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service? Well, I, I think he was playing a very tough hand. I thought he was always very responsive to us on the, on the Finance Committee. Obviously, the uh, charitable you know, organizations, um, there was a great Republican effort to say that this was all you know, partisan kind of stuff. Um, the reality is, as we later learned um, a few months ago, it was kind of equal opportunity bedlam. I mean, it was sort of equal opportunity um, chaos, and the problems that uh, conservative organizations were shared by progressive organizations. So I always um, felt that John Koskinen tried to uh, be responsive to the Congress, responsive uh, to the public. Obviously, there are some huge technological challenges at the uh, IRS. There are some real privacy and cybersecurity challenges at the IRS. But you know, John Koskinen didn't need to do this job. He came out of retirement you know, to do it. I guess the Times or somebody interviewed him and said, what's next for you? He says, I'm sure going to focus on not answering the phone. <laughs> Let's turn to some uh, questions from, from the audience. This is from, from Ed. He, he is asking, when do you expect the Finance Committee to mark up its bill? And then also, what, are the, uh, what is your sense of a level of support in the Center for putting caps on the mortgage interest deduction and limiting state and local tax deduction? Um, senators are playing it pretty close to the vest on a variety of issues. But I will tell you, both of those you know, areas, I think there are going to be some surprises on the state and local matter, and of course, Oregon has one of the highest rates in the country, so we are very much opposed to what this is going to do for the middle class. As you know, we had the Capito Amendment um, during the budget. I led the opposition to it, and I pointed out that you know thousands and thousands of people who make under $100,000 in lots of areas are going to get affected um, by this. So this is not just a New York, California kind of um, issue. Obviously, there are many people in those states that are concerned. But I think you're going to see senators and members in the South um, also pretty concerned about it in the growing suburbs, say, of Colorado, South Carolina, places like um, that. Uh, in terms of the mortgage uh, issue, uh, that's been less Claire, I've heard some Republicans say that they would like to raise it uh, up considerably, but I, I think it is, it's harder to read. And at this point, all we know is that the Republicans said they want to get this done ASAP. They'd like to have it done um, by Thanksgiving. Uh, Chairman Hatch has indicated that he would have some changes that he would make from the House bill. Uh, based on his history, that might involve corporate integration because he's had an interest in this. But I think that would be my take in sort of the prediction, you know, prediction business. I'm, I'm like Yogi Berra on predictions. <laughs> I don't do them especially about the future. <laughs> so another question is uh, that uh, it's unfortunate that the Democrats weren't allowed to play ball in formulating the, the tax proposal. But why didn't the Democrats assemble to create a counterproposal? Well, for, first of all, Mark, you can't negotiate with yourself. You've got to have both sides of the aisle willing. And Mitch McConnell, from day one, played hardball. He said, we're going to do this by reconciliation. So the very most partisan off-ramp was what they chose. And I gather there were times where he said, no Democrat is interested in working in a bipartisan way. And so people came around and asked me and said, well, you know, it passed his prologue. I made it pretty clear I'm interested. Uh, Senator Schumer, the Democratic leader, all of us 
laid out our principles. We said we would like to do bipartisan tax reform. We talked about it focusing on the middle class. We talked about it not giving the breaks to the people at the top. We talked about it not clobbering Social Security and Medicare. And when the Democrats went to the White House to meet with the president here recently, I guess it was happenstance, but they were only the Democrats who were up for election in 2018 in states won by Donald Trump and me. Yeah. Must have been an accident. <laughs> um, what happened, no, I'm yes. just apropos yes. of wrapping yes. this up. What happened is we said what our principles were, and the president said he was for all of them. He said, nope, tax cuts shouldn't go to people like me. So eventually, because I was invited as well, I said, Mr. President, these words are, are good, but that's not what's down on paper. So we have made it clear, Senate Democrats, we think the tax code is broken. We've laid out principles that we think could make for a bipartisan bill. Our principles don't even go as far as what was done in 1986, like making uh, income from wages and investments the same. So we've indicated we'd like to have a bipartisan bill. So another question from, from Anna it says, one of the um, innovative provisions in the Ways and Means proposal is this excise tax on multinational firms that, that you discussed, the 20% excise tax. And you characterize it as a tax on consumers. Why, why is that? Well, let's kind of walk it, walk it through. I mean, it really is designed as an enforcement measure in a tax bill. And like the border adjustment tax, middle class families would be forced to foot the bill for increased costs of cars and clothes and food. So if Nestle sells candy bars to the Nestle distributor in the United States, the payment made from the Nestle distributor to Nestle Switzerland is subject to a 20% tax. So this is yet another proposal, and it's, again, souped up and disguised, but it is another hit on the bottom line of middle class families. So here's a question, kind of more of a, a political take. Do you think any Senate Democrats... Do you think Democrats, this stuff has any, got any politics in it? Do you think any Senate Democrats would vote for this tax bill? Well, I'm not going to speak for my colleagues, but what I can tell you is... 45 of the members of the caucus signed the letter that Senator Schumer and I worked on you know, together, and the other three said that they believed in the core principles. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of upcoming meetings, and I, I haven't seen any evidence that Democratic senators are changing their position. Okay. Um, question from our, our online audience saying that what I've heard today is a lot of uh, um, bashing of Republicans and Democrat talking points, but how about the increased standard deduction in the child credit? How will that help the middle class? Well, first of all, when people say that there was Republican bashing, I want to come back to the fact that there's only one actual bipartisan tax reform bill that has been written since 1986. And I wrote it with a member of the president's cabinet. And it very much tracks the principles in the Democratic letter. So that the principles in the Democratic letter very much track 86. And there's a bipartisan bill. So this notion that this is just you know, a bunch of bashing is not true. But let's kind of unpack the concern about the middle class. There's a lot of this that's got a one hand giveth and the other hand taketh away you know, flavor. Now, I'm glad that Republicans have copied our feature of increasing the standard deduction. We actually called for tripling it. But the big difference between the bipartisan bill and what the Republicans are doing is, A, we didn't write in dis disappearing ink, and the family credit, which is so important, disappears in six uh, six years, and we didn't take away the personal exemptions. So I know that uh, last week the Republicans were really touting the idea that somebody who made kind of median income 
family of four uh, would get a tax break of like eleven $1 hundred dollars. Right. I think family of four, two kids, that kind of thing. Yep. And you know, we had the finance staff really unpack that. And it just looked to us that maybe on a perfect day, that middle class person would get a sliver. But they better not have medical expenses. They better not have student loan expenses. They better not get clobbered by a wildfire like somebody in the West because they're going to lose property and casualty you know, right off. So that, that's my point. Um, here's a question from, from Jeffrey. Um, Looking at the fiscal situation going forward, would it make sense to create uh, Simpson Bowles 2.0? Well, I, I have always been for looking for principled bipartisanship. And I have always thought this topic lends itself to it. In 1986, Democrats and Republicans found common ground around some key principles. Democrats said the special interests have hijacked the tax code. That's still pretty much true. Republicans said that all of these additions and changes has made the tax code so inefficient that you can't grow the private economy. I still share that view. So there are principles both sides can agree with. And by the way, if you talk to Simpson and Bowles, they will tell you for their modeling on taxes, they used our bipartisan bill. Mm -hmm. They made a point of saying they used our bipartisan bill. So my sense is that we don't need another you know, commission. What we need is, in effect, Republicans to say, as the president did, hey, I agree with all of these principles. And then I'm sure there are some things that they have, and then you can discuss them. That's not what's going on now. What's going on is a far-right wish list, not tax reform at all, a big tax cut, moving through the Congress with the speed of light because it can't stand sunlight. And I don't think that's in the public interest. Okay. Um, to uh, get down to, drill down to a, a, a more of a micro issue, on the pass-through provision with the maximum rate on, on pass-through businesses, um, there are some, uh, some proposals in there to try to prevent people from gaming the system to a 70-30 rule and other things like that. Um, there's a, another idea, this idea of wage certification that might prevent business owners from converting wage income into business income. Is that something that's on your radar screen? Well, what I can tell you is I asked Secretary Mnuchin for months to give us some clear take on the guardrails. And he always said that he would do it, and that he said it was almost like the marquee at the old movie house, where the old movie house would say, coming soon, and the picture never showed up at your place. We never, <laughs> we never got that kind of um, information. And I asked a number of economists how you would administer this approach in a fair way. And they basically threw up their hands and said uh, they felt it couldn't be done. So now we have the facts and circumstances arrangement with the Internal Revenue Service in effect trying to uh, figure out a way to administer it. But the reality is uh, we know who benefits the most. And those are not those that are actually doing the work. 100% of the income of wealthy investors that don't actually work in the business would be taxed at the lower rate, while only a fraction of the income would be eligible for those contributing true sweat equity. So it looks to me like, again, if you're a crafty accountant, and I described them as trying to become partner on K Street, this is a pretty good, pretty good time. and. Uh, these so-called guardrails are going to be sort of guardrails in name only. And so if we're looking at the budget situation going forward, one of the guardrails that Congress has is the PAYGO rules, statutory PAYGO rules. Do you see any way that those would be waived um, going forward? Well, the way that the bill 
actually works, and I fought it in the budget committee, is the budget committee chairman, in our case, um, Senator Enzi, basically has unilateral authority to say that reconciliation instructions are being met. So uh, this is certainly a curious you know, way to, to do business, mm -hmm. to basically say it's not any of the official scorekeepers, but at least mm -hmm. with respect to, because you know, this has been hard to dissect the kind of sausage making, but the language basically says that you can have a $1.5 trillion net deficit, okay? So all the people were supposed to be so tight with the dollar and scrupulous about budgeting. We're back in the, hey, I guess the debt isn't big enough now, you know? 20 trillion, not big enough. Let's, let's jack it up some more. And the reality really is that if they want to end up, who knows where they're going to end up, with a tax cut even bigger than that, they can, in effect, hit Social Security and um, entitlement programs, health programs, and the like, and say, well, Mike Enzi passed judgment. And Mike Enzi says we complied with the reconciliation instructions. Um, here's what may be a softball question for you. Um, the U.S. corporate tax rate is one of the highest in the world. Would you um, favor reducing the U.S. corporate tax rate, and how would you pay for that lower corporate well, rate? Well, I'm for Democrats and Republicans coming together, as I did with Judd Gregg and Dan Coats, and said, look, let's put together a competitive rate mm -hmm. that applies worldwide get rid of deferral, and if you get rid of deferral, as we did, you open up a big chunk of money to start making um, changes that produce red, white, and blue jobs and the kind of changes in America. And that sort of fits in your um, approach to taxing all different types of income at the same rate, not having split rates. Because if, I, know, if I could wave my wand, Mark, I'd pick right up on the Reagan, Bill Bradley principle of 86. A dollar is a dollar is a dollar. And by the way, take a look at what Joe Manchin has had to say on this topic over the last few months. That's included in his proposals. Here's a, a, another micro question coming from, from Dana. Would an amendment to close the carried interest loophole, would that clear the Finance Committee? Well, I don't know if you're talking about what was proposed yesterday, but that's no real you know, change. You know, that's basically saying, let's have a couple of years, and then you get to you know, cash in. I mean, it is still trying to maneuver your way to call compensation, ordinary compensation, something that's eligible for the business rate. And this gets back to your, question, uh, your point earlier about a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. If you have a dollar of compensation, you'd want to tax the same, regardless of how you received it. And here, we have a situation where there's a split rate, and so there's a big incentive to characterize it as a lower rate uh, tax system. And by, by the way, if big economic interests are, figure, are able to figure out a way to call themselves, you know, pass throughs, be eligible for the business uh, rate, that's also going to mean that we won't have, I see Eric, who spent a lot of time on these issues, they won't be making payments into Social Security and Medicare in terms of taxes as well. So those programs are going uh, to take a hit too. And this gets to the idea of uh, long run um, issues. If we have a big unpaid for tax cut now, how do you see the federal budget being um, well, adapting over well, time? We know what history tells us. History tells us that you can get a sugar hit. You can get this sort of temporary high by pumping some of this money out, but then you get the big deficits, and then you have to come back and raise taxes, and it puts a lot of pressure on uh, the domestic side of the budget. And some people, uh, going back to Dave Stockman, almost like this idea. They see this as a way to starve the beast. Mm -hmm. And so, um, looking at the Ways and Means Committee bill, one thing that that I think Mr. Brady should get a little bit of credit for is actually doing some hard things. There are some difficult reforms in there, and you've seen interest groups come out being opposed to some of those 
some of those reforms. Um, would you give him any credit for, for doing hard things? Well, I, I think if on day one you throw up your hands and you say you're not going to try, you're not even going to try to do a bipartisan bill, I just can't give you a passing grade on wanting to do heavy lifting you know, on taxes. Kevin Brady has always been very cordial to me, so this is not personal. But if on day one you say, we're out of the bipartisan business, we're going to just do it our way, it's our way of the highway, maybe we can go behind closed doors, we can write our own bill, then we'll see if a couple of Democrats in challenging political environments can come and be with us and we'll call it a bipartisan bill. Uh, I, don't, I don't find that um, something I can give a passing, passing grade to. To not try to do a bipartisan uh, bill, I just think is detrimental to this country. And it's contrary to the history of successful tax reform. It's contrary to what markets tell us, that businesses want certainty and predictability. And they aren't going to get it if it's just our way or, or the highway. Are there provisions in there? Of course. I mean, people were joking that, well, he copied the Wyden Gregg approach in terms of doubling the standard deduction. Well, the concept's there, but then when you do the one hand giveth and the other hand taketh away and the disappearing ink and the family credit, it doesn't resemble what we did in a bi bipartisan way. And so I guess the bottom line lesson to take away is, in, in your mind, looking at tax reform, it's hard to do. It's at least conceivable to do tax reform in a bipartisan way, and it'd be much more permanent if it was done in a bipartisan way. So I'm putting you down for a big bipartisan well, I, I, I think it's one thing if a member of Congress just walks in and says, hey, I'm for, I'm for bi bipartisanship. But there's a lot of sweat equity in the bipartisan you know, cause right now. And I think as of right now, this is an extraordinarily serious missed opportunity. That's the only way I can describe it. My, one of my favorite comments comes from a great uh, late Israeli diplomat, Abi Ban, where he said, the Americans always get it right after they've tried everything else. And I think if the middle class sees what's in this bill, if they actually see what this means for their families and their future, and the medical expenses, and paying the bills, and students you know, trying to get ahead, I hope that this bill will see the fate of the Trump Care 1, Trump Care 2, and Trump Care 3 health care proposals. And then Republicans will say, hey, like the president said at the White House, we agree with this, 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 and this and say they want to accept the principles that we're talking about, and we work to uh, address some of their concerns, and you do what really is in the country's interest, which is principled bipartisanship. And I'll close with this, because I don't think people kind of put this necessarily in the appropriate context. Politics is about when both sides take each other's crummy ideas and then say, oh, look at us, we're being bipartisan. Principled bipartisanship is taking each other's good ideas. That's what Ronald Reagan and a big group of Democrats sought to do. That's what I've been trying to do for well over a decade. That's what Democrats, in terms of laying out our principles, did where virtually every Democrat has said they signed on and said the tax code's broken. We want a bipartisan bill. So my hope is that the thinking of Abe Iban uh, and our country will prevail on tax reform sooner rather than later. But right now, it's going to take a very uh, critical grassroots effort from people all over the country, as they did with health care, to show that this is not something that is going to help our country get ahead for the long term, and we need something that is built around the principles we've been talking about. Well, Senator Wayne, thank you very much for being here on Election Day. I urge everybody who's here or watching online, if you have an election in your district, get out and vote. I think that makes democracy work better. 
also having conversations like this makes right. democracy work better. So thanks for coming. Big thanks. Thanks, thanks everybody. <laughs> that was a lot of fun.